Joining me now, Howie Carr, columnist for the Boston Herald and the author of two books on Whitey Bulger, The Brothers Bulger and his latest, Hitman. Thank you for joining me tonight, Howie. Thanks for having me, Lawrence. Howie, um, the FBI said they, they, that they felt uh, they put out this ad campaign recently. They, they started doing ads in a few television <coughs> markets around the country, especially targeting women's programming, right. putting up pictures of Whitey, but also, most importantly, pictures of the girlfriend, uh, in trying, in effect, to say to women, if you've seen either one of these people, especially if you've seen this girlfriend, please let us know. The FBI today is claiming that that is exactly how they found him. They're claiming that the tip they got yeah, was a yeah. result of this ad campaign. Uh, what do you think? Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, suspicion in Boston that this was a, a set-up job. You know, back in the 1950s and 60s when J. Edgar Hoover was uh, uh, making the uh, FBI the, the, the respected organization it used to be, they would uh, oftentimes find a, find a fugitive and basically have his house surrounded and then put out a press release saying he was on the top ten most wanted list and ten minutes later he'd be arrested and everyone would say, gee, what a, what a great job the FBI did. Uh, this, this sort of has, uh, has uh, faint echoes of that, that uh, uh, that old-time FBI operation, doesn't it? It does. How are your listeners reacting to this? Because, you know, uh, the, the Boston listeners, your show, and just Boston people in general, they don't take stories like this at face value. They don't, they don't take the idea that Whitey's been hiding for 16 years, rumored to be in Europe, rumored to be all over the world and all sorts of different strange places. And here he is found, you know, I don't know, about seven, minute, seven miles from the nearest uh, federal building where the FBI has uh, offices. Uh, I suspect that there's a lot of suspicion in your radio audience audience today about how this happened. Yeah, our, our poll question today was, do you think the FBI knew where he was before they put the public service announcements on the air and it came back 82 percent did think <laughs> they knew uh, where he was? I mean, they, the, ads, the ads were running in California on uh, San Francisco and uh, San Diego markets, but they weren't running in L.A. Uh, so, I mean, who, who saw this? And, and you've seen, you just showed the picture of uh, Whitey and uh, Catherine uh, Gregg. They, they, they don't look like the, the pictures on the Wanted poster. They look like Mr. and Mrs. Santa. Claus, you know? Yeah. American yeah, Gothic, m missing the pitchfork. And L.A. would be the most expensive TV market they put those ads in, so maybe they wanted to skip it. Uh, but that's what I love about the Boston audience is the FBI can say whatever they want, and they're just gonna, you guys are going to sit there and go, okay, prove it to me. And, Howie, let's talk about why the FBI doesn't exactly have the highest level of credibility in Boston, starting with John Connolly. Well, John Connolly was a, a neighbor of uh, uh, Whitey and Billy Bulger in South Boston, and he got uh, he got on the FBI through uh, his U.S. House Speaker John McCormick back in the 1960s, who was also a close ally of the uh, Bulgers. People don't remember John McCormick nowadays, but he was he was first in line for the presidency after JFK was shot, and uh, John Connolly was kind of a, uh, a protege of Billy Bulger, the Senate president, and uh, and he always took care of Whitey, and uh, he made him a top echelon informer. They were trying to make Whitey a top echelon informer on direct orders of J. Edgar Hoover as early as 1970. And we think that that, prob those, those, uh, that, that the request probably came from McCormick, you know, to, to protect him by making him an informant. So Connolly eventually just sort of became uh, more and more uh, enamored of, uh, of, of uh, my Irish, as he called the gang, and Whitey in particular. And uh, he, he eventually pretty much joined the gang, and he, he tipped them off, and he, he received uh, huge amounts of money uh, from, uh, from Whitey over the years. It's kind of like uh, Goodfellas, uh, where uh, Robert De Niro has to tell his gang after the left hands of robbery to stop uh, spreading the money around. Why, uh, John Connolly was spreading it around. And John Connolly, by the way, has uh, since been convicted of racketeering, uh, working on behalf of uh, Whitey Bulger's mob. And this week, he's going to be transferred from Butner, North Carolina, where he's been uh, serving a federal prison sentence with, with Bernie Madoff, down to Florida, where he's been convicted of second-degree murder. He's, got a, he's, he's looking at 40 years in prison. And, and he, he's, he's probably going to be the second Boston FBI agent to uh, to die in prison. H. Paul Rico, another guy who knew Whitey very well, was arrested for a murder in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and died in the prison hospital about three or four years ago.
You know, uh, Howie, as I said in the introduction, uh, John Connolly that was the idea for the Matt Damon character in The Departed, and it's, it's really very, very similar. Growing up in the neighborhood, uh, the Whitey Bulger neighborhood, getting into the FBI, it's, it's, it, it reads like, you know, a very long plan, life plan to get this guy in there. I got to tell you, I was in court. I saw John Connolly testify uh, when he was considered a, an absolutely straight FBI agent, and in the courtroom in Boston, in a federal courtroom, yeah. nobody could crack him. No one could come close to making him uh, seem like anything but the most credible of FBI agents at the time. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a shock not just to Boston, but to the FBI institutionally to discover they had somebody this dirty. Do you think that had anything to do, and I know in Boston there is this suspicion, that, that the FBI wasn't looking for Whitey Bulger very hard because they didn't want the John Conley story coming back up? Well, I think it was starting to uh, percolate to the surface uh, when uh, Whitey left town. And, and again, he, John Connolly wasn't the only corrupt agent in Boston. There was that guy who died in Tulsa, H. Paul Rico. There was another guy who uh, testified he received $7,000 from, uh, from Whitey. Uh, Whitey altogether gave, quote unquote, gratuities to at least 14 agents in the Boston office. And, you know, he had a saying at uh, Christmas when he'd be sitting in the back of his liquor store uh, putting all the cash in envelopes. He said, uh, Christmas is for cops and kids. And uh, the, the FBI gave him good value in return. You know, they, uh, they took out first his, uh, his allies in the, uh, the non-mafia gang, the Winter Hill gang, and then they, uh, after they were eliminated in a race-fixing uh, case that, where Whitey was just an unindicted co-conspirator, then they moved against the mafia. And they listed Whitey as uh, one of the informants on the wiretap. So, of course, that meant that they couldn't prosecute Whitey no matter what evidence turned up in, when they were uh, bugging the Italians in the North End. They, they, they took very good care of Whitey Bull. Howie, I have one uh, Whitey story that you haven't heard because it comes from a friend of mine who went out on a date with Howie, with uh, with Whitey in the 1960s. So we're talking, you know, four decades ago or more. Uh, she's still afraid of Whitey right now tonight. Doesn't want me to tell yeah. this story. Went out on a date with him. Uh, he pulled the car over at Tinian Beach, uh, and he basically asked for sex. She uh, was immediately tried to get out of the car. He pulled a gun. She jumped out of the car and ran. That's the last time she ever saw Whitey Bulger, and she's lived a very happy life since then. But she lives in fear of that story being told tonight, even with Whitey in custody, because this guy is not some romantic Bonnie and Clyde figure. This guy really is exactly. a sociopath who was extremely dangerous with every breath he took. Just give us, finish up for us, Howie, with who this guy really was, what kind of criminal this guy really is. He, he killed 19 people. His partner in, uh, in the mob was a guy named uh, Steve Flemmy. Steve Flemmy had problems with uh, two girlfriends, both of them named Deborah. So Whitey strangled both of these girls uh, in his, in, with his bare hands and then chopped off their, finger, uh, their fingertips and pulled out all of their teeth just so they couldn't be identified. He, uh, he, he, uh, Catherine Gregg, the woman he was running uh, around with for all these years in, in your hometown, was... Uh, she had two brothers. She had. A, she had. She was married to a Boston firefighter named McGonagall. McGonagall had two brothers who were in a, a rival faction in South Boston. Whitey killed both of her brothers-in-law.